Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? It's the week of no excuses here on Double Feature uh, <laughs> with your hosts, <laughs> Eric Ingram and Michael Kester. I will tell you what it means. What it means is you can currently acquire the two films we're doing today on the show for free oh, I get what on you mean. the internet. You're saying that uh, there is no illegality that accompanies downloading a bucket of blood or the tingler. You know, in my capitalistic world, I assume that people make a decision to either see the film and pay money or don't pay money and not see the film. Yeah. But yeah, I suppose the unspoken third option of steal the film. I've that, never uh, said, I didn't say steal the film. I just said you could download the film for free. A free download. It's true. Um, if you go on the website, doublefeatureshow.com, and you look up The Tingler and a Bucket of Blood, if this is a recent episode when you're listening... That should be at the top of the page. <laughs> you can actually download this for free. In fact, uh, there's going to be a whole page of public domain films that we've covered right on there. So Fantastic. go on the episode page, download these movies if you haven't seen them, because we're going to spoil them. What are the names of the two movies? Uh, we're doing The Tingler and A Bucket of Blood. Beautiful. So we're going to spoil those two movies. If you, um, if you haven't seen one or the other, or you're not interested, or you want to save 20 minutes of your time or whatever, you can use the chapters. This beautiful little feature built into the show where essentially you can uh, go up to the menu or hit skip on your iPod or what have you and skip over the section of this episode that contains this intro or the tingler or a bucket of blood or even the ending. You Maybe we get skip, done talking about skip the outro. We get done talking about a bucket of blood. You don't want to spoil what happens next time on the show. You just <laughs> skip right to the end. A lot of people have trouble getting into older films, kind of black and white stuff. Uh-huh. These are two great ones. Oh, yeah. I mean, public domain isn't the real theme. The real theme is uh, getting, once again, back into this great rainy day double feature sure. stuff. The stormy stuck inside, you know, we did Clue and The yeah. House on Haunted Hill. I was perfect for yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And I submit to you, we have another perfect one. But we also have a perfect set of films if you're trying to get into older stuff. Uh, These may be some of our absolute favorite black and white movies Definitely, Everyone will have a fantastic time with them. So we'll start with The Tingler. Okay. Now, The Tingler, much like The House on Haunted Hill, was a William Castle movie. Yeah, you can't start with, you can't talk about The Tingler without talking about William Castle. That's for fucking sure. You can't even see The Tingler without talking to William (laughs) Castle. Yeah, I guess that's true. You get an introduction by him. Uh, He's a weird guy. Producer, director of this film. Among other things that we'll surely talk about, he also produced Rosemary's Baby. I mean, between him and Corman, we're talking about some no fucking around producers yeah, today on the show. Corman will come up in the in the next movie. It has nothing to do with this one, but as a producer, William Castle was. I mean, the guy mortgaged his house to independently produce his first of the the gimmick films that he did. Yeah, you know, before he did everything under uh, William Castle Productions. He had to basically sell off his house, mortgage his house, so that he could get the money for that. So anyways, the thing he comes on the show to tell us is that a scream at the right time may save your life. Yeah. Which I suppose is technically true. Right. Yeah, I I suppose so. If you find yourself in a certain situation, screaming may in fact save your life. Right. But the movie doesn't go on for very long before I realize uh, the other thing I miss is Vincent Price. Yeah. Oh my God. He uh, he was in House on Haunted Hill, uh, the other William Castle movie. Mm-hmm. That was the uh, the second of the two they did together. Yeah, and we also uh, we also saw him in The Last Man on Earth, which came before I Am Omega, which came before I Am Legend. Cannot get. I believe it was the Omega Man. I'm by sorry. The way. I Am Omega is the book. Wrong show, Michael. Wrong show. So we have had opportunities to talk about Vincent Price before. The way he uh, pronounces the title of the film, he Uh can even get away with a titular line just because of the way he carries himself. I mean, I love the way that that rolls off his tongue, the tingler. Like we were talking about on on Red State, how a demeanor, how um, the the way you kind of carry yourself as an actor, that performance can really 
I mean, that could be an entire film. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of times I find myself watching Vincent Price films for Vincent yeah, Price. Yeah, totally. One of the, the few actors I really do that Vincent for. Vincent Price, he's he's not necessarily an actor because of his body of work and that he worked mm-hmm. with so many low-budget directors. Sure. He's not a sure bet on a great film, but he is a sure bet on a great performance. Yeah, you love being around the guy. He talks in this very, uh, especially in this movie, this soft, deliberate manner it may, in fact, be that varied manner that always leads his wife to betray him yeah. in every fucking movie he's every ever in. Every single Vincent Price movie, he has wifey issues. The Tingler, no exception. But hey, women get other roles in this movie. They yeah. get to be deaf and dumb as well, which is also... <laughs> so I love that you have... This is really... This is the brilliant writing of Rob White, which I want to get to. You have a movie that is about this thing bottled inside all of us. This is really starting to sound metaphorical yeah. already. The terror that's deep down in us. The terror just happens to be a, a little critter that, yeah, you know, right. escapes. Well, one of them escapes uh, into our world and is wreaking havoc. And the only defense mechanism from this is to scream. Right. Screaming paralyzes the tingler. So we have a woman who can't scream. Obviously. Why wouldn't <laughs> you? So Rob White wrote this, and he might better be known as an author, Mm -hmm. but this isn't double sleepy nap time. It is, in fact, double feature. So uh, to treat him as less an author of novels and more an author of films, you would see the rest of his body of work. I mean, you could see a lot of it just with William Castle. Yeah. You know, he did did both of the Vincent Price movies, but he also did Macabre and 13 Ghosts, which uh, was remade. And uh, homicidal as well. Hmm. So he comes up with this little creature, this uh, the Tingler. And one of my favorite parts of the movie, aside from the gimmicks and aside from the Vincent Price, uh, is the actual Tingler. The little rubber centipede the guy. The little crawly guy. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It, uh, it makes a heartbeat sound, which yeah. is great. That's the movie's suspense right. playing at you there. But I love when it crawls out of the box. Yeah, that's... You know, watching the Tingler move... Great. It is kind of, I mean, it's a creepy crawly. Yeah. It's supposed to make you, sure. it's supposed to be the thing you don't want to run past you in a theater. Yeah, exactly. But uh, it looks like it's being moved by an invisible child's hand, uh-huh. you know, kind of making it yeah. march around like some sort of action figure. Right. It's clearly one of classic cinema's greatest monsters. Yeah, absolutely. And it never moves any better than that, <laughs> than when it fumbles out of the box. I mean, that's really for the remainder of the film. Uh, we're playing pretend with it, which is where you want to go for these classic movies. Sure, especially moments where you get Vincent Price wrestling with the little rubber guy. Yeah, right. Those right. are great moments. I mean, Vincent Price really has That's to the sell Ed Wood, the Bella Lugosi fighting yeah, the squid moment. Absolutely. You know? uh, we don't have a motor for the squid. You're just going to have to, you know, flail around in the water a lot. So Vincent Price fighting a toy lobster is, you know, it's it's one of the <laughs> things you come to this movie for. I love when it shows up by the projectionist too. Yeah. Just kind of stalks him from the shelves up yeah. there or, you know, latches itself around someone's throat. It's sure. really, I mean, it's a formidable opponent. It really is if you're sleeping or not paying attention. <laughs> yeah. If you're looking the other way and standing still for a while. Oh, and can't scream. Yeah. Or I guess if, if it has a good enough grasp around your throat, sure. though, right? I mean, if you're sitting in a movie theater, you're just, you're just tingler bait at that point. Yeah. That's the one place you don't want to be. <laughs> Which brings us to some gimmicks. Yeah. And just when you thought you had exhaustively gone over William Castle gimmicks, Mm -hmm. I mean, we talked about a lot of them. Yeah, we we talked about the skeleton. Sure, We talked about the... uh, The skeleton was from The House on Haunted Hill. Right. That was the, um, you know, that was both the movie we did and one of the big gimmicks we talked about, but basically that they would put a skeleton in the the theater and swing it around during a particular scene And we talked about rumble seats. I don't remember the actual name, but where... Yeah, well, we'll get to that too. That's from The Tingler. Oh, really? uh, Yeah, the rumble seats. The first one we talked about was from Macabre. It was uh, that, you remember the Lloyds of London, the life insurance, $1,000 life insurance plan that everybody had to sign? So, you know, he made these people go in and sign this or get these insurance claims. And it was part of hyping up his movies. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of how he sold these things. You know, media circus every time, put ads in the paper and do all sorts of bizarre things for him. This is one of those things in cinema history that it's not a, a first of its kind or something. I mean, I guess it is, but it never took off. 
We're yeah. not looking back at right. this and going, this was the first gimmick of many gimmicks to sure. be used. We may be looking back and going, this was the first acid trip of many acid trips used. Well, yeah, the movie did pave the way for at least altered states. We yeah, can say at right. least one movie in cinema history as having, uh, you're right, the, the first acid trip ever portrayed on the screen, the first LSD trip for uh-huh. whatever that's worth. And of course, just as you get to see Vincent Price fight off a mad lobster, you get to see him fight off LSD too. <laughs> fight the ravishes of LSD. Which is funny because the LSD appears to be a bigger problem than the Tingler yeah. does. Unfortunately, they didn't give the audience a bunch of LSD. That would be a really good way <laughs> That's to make good the gimmick. audience feel interactive. Is just I don't think they had the budget for that. Dose them with LSD. I don't know what LSD costs. Maybe it's cheap. That would be some uh, of the fucking elaborate gimmicks they pulled. Yeah. It couldn't be any more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> well, so there was another show where we talked about the gimmicks too. We talked in Polyester when John Waters and you know Odorama sure. were uh, featured in that film, and John Waters was a big fan of the Castle gimmicks, and so mm-hmm. he brought those back. The entire idea of smell vision and that comes right. from William Castle, but. The gimmicks are hokey, and so you know they're not called back to probably because they didn't work sure. either. They, they work, work for one guy who there, did this. There's a lot of effort that has to go into them for very little payoff, especially now in a yeah. wide release setting. Well, I think if we were to be extremely nice to William Castle, we could perhaps attribute viral marketing and found footage. And sure. Those, I mean, ARGs those are, or some shit. Yeah, they're ultimately gimmicks that are used to sell a movie. They're used to publicize a movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we were to try and trace the origins of Cannibal Holocaust or Blair Witch a little further, we might find some roots in William Castle. Right. So there's a few for this movie. And when we talked about The House on Haunted Hill, it was a good way to bring up a lot of the castle gimmicks. But I think this is a far better way to experience yeah. a lot of the William Castle gimmicks. What I like about The Tingler is that it retains part of the gimmick in a, really in a couple of the things it does. One, it asks for the scream. Sure. So, you know, where most of these gimmicks we talked about, a flying skeleton in the theater and all that, mm-hmm. that was lost. That's, a, that's an experience that was just there at the time for the theater. And had you just found William Castle on Netflix or right. on DoubleFeatureShow.com, you would apparently. You never fucking know. You'd have no idea. You would have no idea. In this movie, however, some of the gimmicks are more apparent. So you know something a little weird is going on in that theater scene. That mm-hmm. was the buzzers we'll talk about. But uh, urging Vincent Price making a call to arms for right. the you know for the theater to start screaming, and then William Castle at the time was planning screamers in the audience because they had fucking mono sound. Could you right. imagine this movie that scream scene yeah. with Dolby surround sound? Yeah. I mean, get some serious, you know, 7.1 or whatever's packed into the theaters these days. <laughs> it would be terrifying. It would be absolutely awful. So instead, he created his own surround by planting people in the audience. It was just their job to scream. He would send them out to theaters and they would go there and they would scream during this scene. And, you know, they had to go to every showing. I mean, this is a, it's a pretty bizarre job to sure. have. Sure. He'd also get people to faint and, and be carried out by nurses and then driven away in actual ambulances. So, you know, they're doing this over and over every time the movie plays. Mm-hmm. It's got to be pretty exhausting. Sure. Well, can you imagine going and seeing the movie again with friends? Right. Oh my God, <laughs> right. I saw this movie. Let's go back and see it later tonight. And then it all happens a second time. Same woman faints. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Wizard of Gore when we yeah. watched Kasten's remake of that yeah. and, you know, seeing these, these same strange events happening uh, time after time. My favorite one, and this one really has the staying power, is the black and white and color scene. Yeah. So while these are both black and white films today, there is a small bit of color, uh, a, a scene that they actually claim that they filmed it in color and use black and white, you know, a black and white set and black and white makeup. The effect is pretty unbelievable yeah, when you see it. Yeah, it's really, really good. So she walks into this bathroom, and when you pan to the sink, it's in red. Mm-hmm. This is the greatest gimmick of all, because myself, uh, I knew things about William Castle, but, you know, I don't spoil anything for myself before I go into this movie, so I didn't really know anything about The Tingler. And I would later look up all the gimmicks and see all the fun stuff sure. and read about that. Uh, William Castle's got an autobiography and stuff. But a scene like this, you actually see it in the movie and it still shocks you today. 
it will shock you forever. Right. Because you never expect a black and white movie to have red blood. And they had the ability to do that at the time, but the movie's still coming out in black and white. It totally disarms you. And then you see that, and it's one thing when it comes from the faucet, but then to pan over to the bathtub. Yeah, with you the know, hand. And see that? Oh, my God. I think it was, uh, it had to be one of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. We talked about that same kind of method. Right. Where it was, let's, you know, paint everything black and white. We'll do the makeup in black and white. And that's how we do, you know, our selective color sure. stuff. But we have to get to what is easily the most well-known one, uh, which is Percepto. That is the seat buzzers. Okay. It's called Percepto? Percepto. Okay. The idea that you could, I guess, perceive the feeling people in the movie were getting. Of the The, tingler? The tingling sensation, Uh let's say. Well, here's how this came around. So they have this little creature that I adore, and they're looking at a a lot of different options for how do we make it feel? Because the, the scene that Percepto took place in is the scream, scream for your life scene, sure. where they shut off the light, and even at home, you still get the same effect right. as you would you know, in a movie theater. With the exception that they wanted this to be a, a Universal Studio ride. I mean, not actually, but Universal right. Studios would later do things much like this and mm-hmm. having these interactive uh, kind of... Exp- you ever been on one of those? No, I've never been there to... There was a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids one. I think sure. there was a... I know um, it was a Terminator one, right? Yeah, I don't. I was just thinking, I don't know if Terminator does that or not, but they have these kind of practical effects built in. I guess that, that stuff is then owed to William Castle sure. as well. But it makes a lot more sense for them because they have a theme park. Yeah. They just do this showing over and over until the the ride ends, until it's no longer featured in the park. So the tingler crawls across the screen and then starts crawling around the theater. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ever have the chance to see the tingler in a movie theater, obviously it's not going to have some of these effects built in, but to actually feel that theater scene in a theater must be pretty amazing. Sure. To see a projected bug thing on the screen. uh, I mean, it's great even at home. It really is. So as it's crawling around the theater, they want to give people the feeling that it may be crawling right past them. Right. It may be brushing past your legs. So they're looking at all these different options for, you know, making it feel like something is scuttling by you. And nothing made sense. They couldn't really make anything work. And so what they ultimately decided on was these uh, these World War II buzzers to be <laughs> put in seats to basically make the seats vibrate Castle always talks about it, you know, he he uh, electrified the seats, right. which is kind of not actually what really happened. But they put... Um, giant vibrators. Giant vibrators in the seats. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's a different kind of experience for a different kind of theater even. <laughs> but what makes this such a well-known event, I almost said a well-known failure, <laughs> but you know, I think it, it worked out. It gained its notoriety. But the fact was, these things were kind of expensive, and they couldn't afford them for every scene. Right. They say, it sounds ridiculously expensive to fit theaters with sure. giant vibrators. Sure. Well, I think there were less theaters to worry about. Sure. And, uh, you know, the showings weren't nearly as wide as now, when in the city of Chicago, you could go to 20 different theaters. Right. But uh, they could only afford literally a handful of seats, and that's just in the bigger theaters. So that thing where he comes out to the audience in the beginning and says, you know, some people in the audience will experience this, that's probably because they had, what, two, three of these things wired into the chairs. And the projectionist, it was his job to set them off during the screen scene. (laughs) So it wasn't like they actually brought an operator to these, these theaters. You can only imagine how the fucking projectionists and the, the theater crews felt about William Castle. Yeah. Every time they bring his movies in, they have this special set of instructions of, you know, now you're signing up to basically be in a haunted house yeah. for, you know, a couple of weeks, Sounds maybe like even months. The ass. It does. It does. I mean, I'm sure some of the projectionists and the people who worked there loved it, but I'm also sure a lot of them are accustomed to their job of hanging out in a booth and hated it. Yeah. I want to talk just really briefly about my favorite William Castle gimmick because we didn't get to it last time and it's not from uh, The Tingler. It's from Homicidal. It was the uh, the fright certificate. So the idea of... And, you know, at first it wasn't a great idea. The fright certificate was basically just... Uh, it was one of his last gimmicks. And I think probably because it did become so much work for theaters to 
do these things that they started to just pass on his right. films. Oh, great. Another William Castle thing. Fuck that. But for whatever reason, it wore out its welcome or he decided to, to stop doing it. One of the last things was this fright certificate. He put a countdown in this movie right before the, the film's climax and basically said, if you couldn't handle it during this countdown, you were allowed to leave the theater and get a full refund. If it was too scary for you, so many people were going to have to run screaming out of the, the movie uh-huh. that they would give you a refund. The problem here was that people actually left the film. <laughs> Not a lot of people, but enough of them to upset Castle. Sure. So this is where it gets really good. To uh, diminish the amount of people that got refunds, he revised the setup. So instead of just walking out calmly and saying, oh, hey, I'd, I'd like my refund for this movie, he set up this kind of apparatus in the theater where there were these yellow steps under this yellow light that beamed down, uh, directing you towards what was called the coward's corner. And the coward's corner was this big yellow booth with a nurse in it who would take your blood pressure. Uh-huh. And then as you walked through the coward's corner and, and basically were processed for your refund inside the theater, you had to do it, first of all, in front of the audience who would loudly you know, mock you. Sure. But uh, even more so than the people who might be sympathetic at the time, uh, the, the audience that might be sympathetic, there was a recording that would play that would basically call you a chicken and mock you in front of everybody else in the theater <laughs> over the movie he was wow. literally doing this a, a lot of people you need dead silence in a movie nobody likes being behind the kids that are talking the whole way through william castle said fuck that i'm gonna have a blaring loud recording that mocks my audience if they want to leave and then you know once you went in there and you talked to the nurse or whatever you would sign this big slip this uh big fucking sheet that said i am a bona fide coward in order to get wow. your refund Needless to say, people stopped asking for refunds. Yeah, I would. Uh, oh, my God. That sounds like such a pain in the ass, though. No, it really is. So let's add bureaucracy to the horror experience. <laughs> That's what it's always been missing. Yeah. I think I would have done it just to have my sure. bona fide coward certificate. Imagine what it would be like to have one of those today. It's great. So A Bucket of Blood is the other film and uh, near and dear to both of our oh hearts Oh, my here. God. Do we love this film? In a very William Castle-like gimmick, they would let you in for free to this movie if you showed up to the theater and gave the ticket taker, the front counter or whatever, a bucket of blood. Oh my God. Ridiculous. I don't think it has to be human blood, obviously, sure. but I'm, I'm wondering how many people showed up uh, with a fucking bucket Varying full of blood. buckets of blood. And if the theater would actually honor that. So this is a uh, a rare breed in that it's a Roger Corman film without Vincent Price. Who yeah. would have thought that was possible? <laughs> but you get Dick Miller in really what's a rare starring role. Yeah, it's Dick Miller's only starring role. In yeah, his he basically never career. did another one, right? No, he ended up uh, he ended up That's doing sad. a lot. He did a lot of supporting roles for Corman thereafter. He was in uh, Little Shop of Horrors, which we covered. Sure, he was in The Terror. He ended up being in a lot of. Um, Joe Dante movies, yeah, which yeah. we've covered in exhaustive detail. Sure. Uh, whenever Dick Miller shows up, he's in Gremlins, Small Soldiers. He's in. Uh, he was in Amazon Women on the Moon, and his scenes got cut. Oh. Um, but he's never the lead, except for Bucket of Blood. Why is he never the lead? There's Why? no reason. He's amazing. He's Walter such Paisley a good lead. It goes down in history for me as one of the most heartfelt film leads of all sure, time. Sure, he is. He is. The charisma the guy brings is, uh, it's on Vincent Price levels. Yeah. It's just this, man, I would go to movies to see Dick Miller. He's so good. I mean, you love this guy so much, this character. Could you imagine this movie? We'll get into him being a killer, right? Yeah. So that's, that's where this film's going if you haven't seen it. Can you imagine this movie with a killer that you didn't like? What yeah. a different movie this would be? I believe it would be the remake, potentially. So he plays this busboy uh, who's incredibly passionate about the arts. Yeah. You know, that's a large part of his character is he just wants to talk to everybody about art. Right. Every table he waits on. Sure. Well, but he doesn't, he's not a creative type. No. That's that's the He's wonderful trying, but juxtaposition so of Walter Paisley is being an admirer of the arts who wishes he could be an artist, 
but can't tap into his creative side. All the art that he spews is just verbatim repetition from poems he knows and poems he's heard and quotes he knows. He never, I mean, throughout the entirety of the film, never creates anything completely of his own volition until the very end. At what point do we start talking about Exit Through the Gift Shop? I think I'm at a loss <laughs> there. So he's directed through the movie by Roger Corman. Right. And we talked Corman uh, a bit on that Little Shop of Horrors right. episode. But uh, how did this thing come together? You're a big, big, big Corman guy. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, Little Shop of Horrors, is it's a great film to pair this with because they shot it uh, three days, the three extra days that they had on the set for sure. B- Bucket of Blood. Sure. Uh, Bucket of Blood was filmed in less than a week. Wow. Um, it was written in less than a week prior to that. Oh, yeah. This is the one that was five days or whatever, right? right? He he oh, rented Jesus. the studio for seven days, yeah. shot Bucket of Blood in five days, and then decided, oh, let's rent the studio for an extra two days. That's crazy. Reshoot Bucket of Blood, but make it funnier and more obviously a horror film. And right. that's where Little Shop came from. So that's why this movie appears to be so subtle. Right. Because it's well, the... that's, that, that was the mistake that Roger Corman noticed while they were shooting the film is that the beat generation is so subtly hilarious right. that it seemed like he wasn't mocking them. And all the jokes fell a little flat because you couldn't tell that everything was making fun of this ridiculous art world because that's actually how the art world was. Right. So it was too accurate is what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. So he intended this to be a comedy. Sure, it's supposed to be. I mean, it is essentially supposed to be one of the front runners in the horror comedy genre. Right. It's not supposed to be a horror film, but it's supposed to be, you know, a horrifying look into, you know, what, Art might become right, if right. it gets too out of hand. And it, it fell flat. When art gets out of hand, that's yeah. the moral of the story. Here. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I always got the feeling it was a comedy, but I never knew that, you know, this is what Roger Corman's subtlety could have looked like. Right. Because this is pretty early in his directing career, yeah. right? So, you know, he does a little shop of horrors then as what, a reaction to not funny enough? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, he shoot it's it's not a thing like he saw the audience response to Bucket of Blood because sure. Bucket of Blood hadn't come out. Sure, it was shot right. the day before. Sure. But he noticed while shooting Bucket of Blood that uh, basically Dick Miller was too good and too honest and all right. of these beatniks were too accurate. Sure. And so he ended up coming with a more preposterous story which I guess ended up having a real legacy while Bucket of Blood fell by the wayside, even though I think it's a far superior effort. Oh, yeah, definitely. Film. Well, the comedy is so much better. Oh, my God. It. I it, It's one of the few movies, and, and you can attest to it because we were both sitting here cracking up. Yeah, right. It's one of the few movies that I laugh out loud to on repeat viewings, and I've seen yeah. it so many times. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so much of that is the beatniks. Yeah, it is. You know, the... Uh, we almost start our movie outside of narrative. It almost starts like William Castle talking to the audience. Right. Instead, it's uh, it's really starting the way the last movie ended with the character staring into the camera. Mm-hmm. It turns out it's just a beatnik poem. Yeah. It's not someone delivering you're about to see a moral tale to, right. to the audience. It's a fucking beatnik poem. And, you know, I have trouble telling the difference. Sure. Well, he just sits there, spews a bunch of nonsense with some pretty words and repeats himself in the wrong spots. And that becomes a poem. Oh, God. So aside from the comedy, they're the backdrop. Your environment is the coffee house. Yeah. The little art shop coffee house is the backdrop for this film. And it's hilarious it's weird that you go to an environment that is the thing that is funny right there's just the funny room and we're gonna hang out there (laughs) between our scenes well all the characters are um, it's it's again it's the fault of the film's humor all the characters are immersed in this art world sure there's nobody who's in the film as an outsider looking in pointing out how goofy and dumb all these people are right because everybody has bought a little piece of the farm here everybody is totally sold on the far out beat generation and sure and uh you're nothing if you're not an artist yeah right and the artist is nothing i mean it's it's all this bullshit and garbage that 
people actually believe is what the beat generation was about. Sure, sure. You hear these poems and you sit there cockeyed, confused, right. thinking, this guy's spewing a bunch of nonsense. I don't understand the beat generation. Sure, sure. When in reality, he's spewing a bunch of nonsense because it's supposed to be a mockery of the beat generation but it seems like the real thing because it's such a strange subculture yeah you know and it's a subculture i thought was lost we talked a little bit about uh this movie and the beatniks when we did one of those music box shows and i remember we said oh we can't say anything about a bucket sure. of blood because when we start to get into the art it's all spoilers and i was really sad because i thought man they just we there's no more beatniks and it's yeah. not funny anymore. But during a little bit of that time I spent in Cupertino, I shopped at Whole Foods a lot and uh -huh. it turns out it's all still there. Yeah, well basically the beat generation has just evolved into the health food it really uh, is. movement. It really is. You know, they're talking about their breakfast, the yep. uh, garbanzo omelet oh my with God. smoked wheat germ or smoked uh, smoked yeast. I or... don't know what any of that even means. But you could go buy that at fucking Whole Foods. You Fry can... a goddamn egg. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to hurt you. It's so fucking perfect. And it's so funny. to. It's funny to me because I am so confused by the health food movement oh, and yeah, the organic right. food generation and the uh, sustainable food generation. Well, because it mocks itself. Yeah. They call them Frankenfoods, Michael. Frankenfoods. <laughs> I mean, it's it's one of those things, just like with this movie... Where you don't even really, it's its a spoof of itself. Right. There's not a lot of work you have to do. Well, they just, they, they talk about all this stuff and don't ever acknowledge its significance. Sure. That's why, that's why Walter Paisley can be an artist. Yeah, right. That's why he can show up with a cat with a knife in it and everybody says, wow, what a wonderful thing. Sure. But no one will go into the significance or what it might mean or right. the implications of but the you piece. don't talk about the art, man. You can't talk well, about the art. Well, because it's 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 absolutely useless, but no one's got the balls to say so. Right. You know, that's why I like our show so much. There's uh, that's why I'm married to this fucking show. There is this thing about art where, you know, you can't talk about it. If, sure. Especially you can't question it. You can't right. uh, say, well, I don't... Under well, hold on, guys. You that's don't just deconstruct a, it. That's just a cat over yeah. there. Yeah. And I think that's really why I like bringing film analysis to people. And, you know, you see that in film analysis, too. It gets so pretentious and loaded that it... Oh, in order to do it, it has to be art itself. Right. It can't just be two people, you know, cussing like sailors. Yeah on the goddamn internet we don't come to this show with the pretense of trying to come up with eloquently stated no not at all <laughs> we said giant vibrators at least twice on this show already Great. maybe you chaptered over it but our show is the kind of show that brings you giant vibrators while the art itself brings you percepto well, and that's the great part, too, is that by being around all these beatniks, you hear them comment on his rise to fame. Sure. You know, the things they do comment on are just as funny as if they <laughs> were deconstructing the art, you know, itself. I think my favorite thing about the treatment of the beatniks here is, like you were saying, there's no straight man to this. Yeah. Everybody is part of the culture. So it's, you know, when we look at a lot of the dark comedies we've done on this show... A lot of them are comedies where you're in the world and everybody in the world is funny because no one realizes they are in the world. Right. There's no one standing there to point it out. And sometimes it's really funny when you have someone standing around who you can kind of sympathize right. with. Right, sure. But I like looking a lot more at these movies that just choose to be their own world and do their own yeah. thing. And then they allow you, they never need to tell the audience, uh, no, it's okay. This is what I meant. No, it's okay. I'm making fun of beatniks. The right. very danger that I seem to have just scolded Roger Corman for, that's actually what I appreciate about it. I like that people come to this movie and aren't quite sure if we're making fun of the beatniks right. or doing a documentary about them. Well, it's just, it's so fun. It's such a fun movie to watch with people because you notice as the film goes on, I remember this back from the music box, mm -hmm. you watch the film and at the beginning everybody's kind of staring at it, figuring out whether it's a bad movie sure, or sure. May, or it's supposed to be funny. Yeah, and so as bad the, it's good. Right. And as the film goes on, people start chuckling at dumb beatnik stuff, and then yeah. other people are, oh, maybe this is supposed sure, to be funny. So sure. by the end of the film, 
you get the moment where Walter shows his boss severed head. Yeah, right. And the boss is confused and the audience was just cracking up because yeah, you yeah. finally get to the moment where you realize this is a joke. Oh, yeah. It's just this if wonderful... If you're not there by that point already. Yeah. And it's it's this wonderful moment where everybody understands that beatniks were absolutely stupid. And it doesn't really make sense to be part of the beat generation because it's just a generation and it's just a movement that's based on never calling itself to any sort of light yeah. and just being shrouded in its yeah. own weird mystery. <laughs> Another idea they tackle in here is uh, that he's kind of an accidental artist. Right. And that comes through in this this other thing, I guess, that's close to our hearts, which is horror and comedy yeah. coming together. Two great tastes that go great together. I really love the idea, first of all, that everyone has art in them. Yeah. I think that's a really cool. I mean, I love to encourage non-art kids to make art or to drag them along on things with me or just kind of see how that process works for somebody who's totally unaware of it or right. didn't think they had it in them. Here we have an accidental artist, which is even better. Yeah, It's somebody who, I mean, <laughs> he wanted to make art, but he never could. <laughs> And then one day, art just kind of fell in his lap. Well, well literally, one day he stabs a cat through a wall, <laughs> sure. and bam! Now he's an artist. Sure. Well, that's the thing, <laughs> and that piece is awesome. the The fucking dead cat is that the name? Uh, it's called yeah, dead, dead cat. cat. Yeah. He's not bloodthirsty. He has not yet become a killer. It's just through his own bumble. I mean, come on. Yeah. If this isn't a funny commentary on art. He accidentally becomes an artist by stabbing a cat through the wall. And so it's uh, it's first through that accident, but later through his own misguided self-defense that he creates his second piece. And uh, eventually it's it's sort of because he just wants to make art. Sure. Well, he, it's it's not even it becomes less about making art and more about being an artist. Yeah. It right. becomes more about the social perception of Walter Paisley, the artist. Sure. Sure. He ends up. Well, because he can't, uh, he can't create except right. to kill. That yeah. is how he reproduces his masterpieces. Well, and essentially, it just gets to the point right around the time. Uh, I don't know what it's called. Uh, strangled woman, the nude. Yeah, um, right. It gets to the point where he officially reconciles. If I'm going to be an artist, I also need to be a murderer. Yeah, and I yeah. think I'm okay with that as long as people like me. Well, he has to be. He has to be. That's the part of the comedy that I think elevates it above just spoof. Sure. It's not just, oh, here are beatniks. I mean, that is the very, very deliberate written part of he has to kill in order to make art. He's yeah. the art killer. And some of his pieces, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I think they're actually kind of awesome. Sure. I think I would love to have Murdered Man as a hat rack in my apartment. Well, these sort of dead silhouettes. I mean, you mentioned the nude one. That yeah. and the cat, I think, are probably my two favorites. Yeah, and then my two favorites are the other two. So good job, film. Way to go. It's a funny concept. But, you know, the other thing I've always liked about it is I think it touches on a very real concern. As an artist, I mean, you know, you you worry about being a one hit wonder sure. that, that you might be accidental. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to say that every artist has that sort of humility problem right. or, or fear of perception. Yeah. The self-esteem yeah. concern, you know, not everybody goes, Oh, am I a terrible artist? Maybe that's pretty universal. I don't know. But uh, the question comes up, can you continuously churn out good work? Uh, do you have it in you or was it just the once, just yeah. the original thing you did or the first couple of things you did? Do you have anything to say anymore? And it's something they touch on really abstractly, you know, by his fear of staying in that culture. He wants to remain an artist, so he has to kill. But I think all of those artists, that's that's sort of the the self-fulfillment of the beatniks. It's why they talk about things the way they do, because they're all afraid of dropping out of their club. They all want to be constantly perceived as artists. Mm -hmm. But for an artist, I mean, that is everything for right. them. You know what I mean? That creating art, especially if it's your livelihood, it is their life. It's their circle of friends. It's, uh, for some of them, it's their living. And if you're constantly questioning your ability to conduct your very own trade, mm -hmm. I mean, I can think of a few other things people do for a living or do, uh, you know, if you think that you are an artist, that is what you are about. That's not true of, say, a technician. Right. 
you know, I never sit around going, oh, am I always going to be good with computers or did I just get lucky <laughs> sure. that one time? Well, art isn't necessarily a skill. Well, for Walter Paisley, especially yeah. for him, it's just murder. It drove him, <laughs> drove him to murder, not only, but uh, he didn't even think twice about it. Yep. So as I mentioned, there's an entire page of public domain films on the, uh, the website. I don't think we've ever talked about that on the show before. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we're always big proponents of the Netflix thing and sure. the iTunes thing, and you can rent or buy that stuff. But if you just want a free download of movies that are pretty fucking good, surprise, surprise, you can get them on the internet yeah. and they're awesome. So go on that. It's doublefeatureshow.com. There's a link to it on the main page there, just public domain films. Um, you can also see an A to Z list of every fucking movie we've ever covered. <laughs> if you're just kind of looking, hey, double feature, have you guys ever done this? We get emails all the time. Um, often give our email address directly here, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. And people email us and they say, hey, uh, why don't you guys do... Uh, the King of Kong? Yeah, it's perfect, full of <laughs> perfect example, right? So it turns out we've done that. Turns out we've done uh, half the movies people ask us about. Yeah. So you can go on the website, you can see them A to Z, or you can see a gallery of the cover for every single movie ever that we've covered anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually that will grow to every the single movie thing, ever. Right. But uh, in the meantime, we have two more films that we need to do next week to increase that list. Yeah. So as of next week, we will have added the cover art for both Sucker Punch and Switchblade Sisters. Get a little uh, Zack Snyder there and get another uh, a bit of a culty exploitation uh, throwback. Yeah, we're going to nail in some more Jack Hill. I guess watch more fucking film. Bye.